Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second part of the eighth master class of Jaipur Surgical Tutorial. Uh, for the benefit of uh, Dr. Francis, who is joining our program for the first time and for others, uh, Jaipur Surgical Tutorial is an online uh, education portal that uh, we have started for last almost three years uh, when I shifted to Jaipur. And uh, this program is being coordinated by my colleague, Dr. Anand Nagar, uh, who is an associate professor of HPB surgery. We conduct an uh, online uh, session for the surgical trainees every Saturday, 9 to 10 morning Indian time. And uh, for the last eight months, we've been doing this uh, monthly masterclass where on the last Thursday and Friday of every month, 7 to 9 p.m., we cover one topic. So we've conducted master classes on living donor liver transplant, on safe cholecystectomy, on acute pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, intensive care, and uh, other topics. So the theme this time is ulcerative colitis. Yesterday we covered some aspects of ulcerative colitis, and today we will touch upon some of the other aspects. So the first speaker for today is a very renowned a uh, colorectal surgeon from Singapore, Dr. Francis Sochen. Uh, he's been a good friend for, I think, a couple of decades for me. I visited him uh, several, several years ago, and he has been a regular and frequent visitor to India. He just now informed me that he was in Cochin just a few days ago for a meeting. Uh, so he is going to continue on what Dr. Das covered yesterday about the surgical procedures for ulcerative colitis. And he is going to tell us how to select what procedure. Some part of it was covered by Dr. Das also when he defined the various surgical procedures. So we will uh, continue on that. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Francis. Uh, could you recognize me? In 2013, uh, you invited me for a, uh, for a talk. You were organizing on Colorectal International Congress. Ah, yes. <laughs> so nice to see you after such a long time. Yeah, uh, sir, uh, I know you are a very, very reputed uh, international colorectal surgeon, apart from other GI surgical procedures. So it will be nice to hear about uh, hear from you. But uh, yesterday, what we uh, heard uh, or we discussed um, in our panel, uh, let me just summarize that one. Uh, first, uh, from Dr. Jayanti, we uh, heard about uh, an algorithmic approach to the medical management of ulcerative colitis and uh, uh, she stressed on the coordination between the uh, surgeon and the gastroenterologist from the ward go uh, since we uh, get the patient because most of the time we found that the uh, treatment was individualistic and it was tailored more or less to the requirement of the patient. She spoke about uh, the newer regimens, the side effects, the vaccinations, and uh, we agreed upon the fact that left-sided colitis should be treated like uh, total colitis or pancolitis. Uh, we stressed about the preventive care and the patient education being so important in the management of ulcerative colitis. We discussed about the advances in therapeutics like uh, stem cells, uh, fecal microbiota transplantation and artificial intelligence. And uh, finally, she concluded by saying that uh, still we are in search for a right treatment for the right patient at the right time for ulcerative colitis. Uh, uh, after that, Dr. Sujay uh, from Ames New Delhi, he discussed about various indications and contraindications for surgical treatment for ulcerative colitis. So uh, the summary was that the commonest indication for uh, surgery in emergency sitting is acute severe ulcerative colitis with failed medical therapy. Uh, our study in end showed that the timing was preferably seven days from the date of commensal of medical therapy in these patients. By that, we can reduce the mortality from 18% to 1%. The treatment of choice in emergency was subtotal colectomy with end ileostomy. 
and he again uh, reiterated uh, the fact that there should be a, a strong coordinated protocol between the gastroenterologist and gastro surgeons for optimum management of these patients uh, from the very beginning that the patient uh, enters into the hospital. Uh, finally, myself, Dr. Das from GI Surgery Ames uh, discussed about various definitions of uh, procedures that are used, mainly four types of procedures are used in uh, surgical management of ulcerative colitis. And we talked about some procedures which are not uh, so commonly used rather than rarely used, but still they have some indications in the therapy. So I have now request uh, uh, Professor Francis to take ahead uh, uh, the proceedings from what we left yesterday. He will speak about uh, how to select the appropriate patients or appropriate techniques for uh, restorative proctocolectomy, which is the main, which is the main stay of treatment for t elective treatment of the ulcerative colitis, surgical part. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kapoor and Dr. Dr. Nash, for inviting me and for allowing me to speak. Now, today, um, I'm actually going to cover a little bit. There may be some, you know, overlap between um, today's uh, talk and yesterday's talk because I wasn't around yesterday. But uh, let me just get my slides in order here. Um, there we are. Now, can you see the slides here? Yes, we can see. Yeah, good. Let's yeah. So, so, yeah. So basically, I, I just want to cover in general detail, and I think so that we can cover quickly, and perhaps uh, in the question answer time, we have more time to really go into more detail. Um, but basically, I just want to talk about how to select the appropriate surgery, uh, not just talking about restorative proctocolectomy. Uh, in cases with ulcerative colitis. Now, um, we all know that the primary treatment of ulcerative colitis must be medical, and there are many medical therapies that I think you have discussed yesterday. But in spite of those um, you know, advances, uh, a quarter, up to 40% of patients will sometime in their life require surgery. Now, when we talk about uh, surgery, ulcerative colitis, there are two main situations. One is elective and the other one is in the emergency situation. Now, when we talk about elective situation, when are those? First of all, there's chronic disease, especially those chronic relapsing disease. They keep relapsing, uh, although we give them treatment of various sorts, perhaps stronger and stronger medication uh, and so forth, they still recur. Then, secondly, there is always that risk of cancer especially in long-standing um, pan-colonic uh, ulcerative colitis. And of course, we know that, especially in young, young patients, we have those complications of medical therapy and also failure of medical therapy. And those patients are what we call patients that need elective surgery. We also have a group of patients, a big group, in fact, uh, we often see, who come in with emergency problems like toxic megacolon, perforation uh, of, of, of the intestines, or massive bleeding, uh, and those with acute, severe uh, relapse um, where we need to treat them. Now, surgery uh, in chronic ulcerative colitis, we, as we said earlier, uh, besides uh, those uh, things that we talk about in the colon, we can also get uncontrollable pyoderma gangrenosum or exfoliative dermatitis, recurrent uh, monoatropathy or severe uveitis. And some of this uh, may need uh, some form of surgical treatment. Now, as far as we, when we look at um, ulcerative colitis, uh, many of us don't realize this. I think especially in Asia or in East Asia, extra uh, gastrointestinal manifestations, ulcerative colitis is not so common. But I found in my time in Europe that uh, they are much more common uh, so I'm not very sure about the Indian situation, but in East Asian, these extra GI manifestations are not very common. But having said that, the activity of these extra gastrointestinal manifestations uh, cease after total colectomy in up to 50% uh, of patients. Uh, and it's, it's higher in, in UC uh, compared to patients with Crohn's disease. Uh, 
But having said that, in certain extra gastrointestinal manifestations, surgery or surgery of the colon does not seem to have any effect. And this are patients with ankylosing spondylitis and those with hepatobiliary complications uh, don't seem to be helped by colectomy. So let's go on. Now, in patients with acute fulminating colitis, uh, this is where uh, a lot of our emergency surgery for colitis uh, takes place. Uh, and the initial presentation seems usually to be the most uh, severe. Subsequent acute uh, um, relapses don't seem this to be so severe. I think usually it's because these patients are treated already with various forms of drugs, although they may not be so effective. And that's why they are not as severe as the first episode where they are not treated at all. And this severe colitis uh, leads very quickly in some patients to toxic megacolon or perforation. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the prognosis depends on the extent of the severity of the colitis, uh, the depth of penetration, and the severity of the attack. Now, if perforation does occur, then you know three-quarters of them will die. Whereas toxic megacolon itself or severe colitis itself, you know, there's a low uh, death rate. So when we see a patient with toxic megacolon, you know, we need to act quickly. And in this situation, as Dr. Das has mentioned earlier, uh, frequent consultation with the gastroenterologist is very important. And in fact, a lot of these patients present to the gastroenterologist and we often have combined meeting with them, emphasizing to the gastroenter uh, as gastroenterologist that they must refer patients early. A lot of them you know, tend to try medical treatment for far too long uh, until patients are very sick. Uh, you know, severe electrolyte abnormalities, patients are perforated before they refer, and that really is a wrong time. Patients should be referred and managed in conjunction with both gastroenterologists and us as surgeons as early as possible. And I think uh, earlier, Dr. Da said, the speaker last night said seven days uh, optimum treatment. I think, in fact, uh, a surgical um, consult should be done as soon as possible, and we've been uh, 72 hours, a decision made for surgery if there's no improvement in the parameters, if the fever is swinging and colitis becomes severe and there's a severe wall edema uh, of the intestines, uh, one has really to consider if surgery should be done. And surgery, if it's indicated, should be done sooner rather than later. Uh, and in, as you know, toxic myocolon, just to put a word in there, if the diameter of transverse colon is more than 5.5 centimeters, we call that toxic megacolon. So 30% um, may respond uh, to conservative treatment, but early surgical consult and emergency colectomy, really, uh, by 72 hours, is there's no improvement in the parameters rather than dragging on and trying various other medication. So let's talk about uh, this sort of surgery, and uh, we, we'll just go through this very quickly. These are some of the methods uh, perhaps haven't been discussed, but uh, or have been discussed. Blowhole colectomy is a very old operation. Uh, Erorectal anastomosis is another one. Total colectomy and ileostomy, or pen proctocolectomy and ileostomy, where the, both the rectum and the colon is removed and ileostomy is formed. Um, and then the restorative proctocolectomy or the ileal anal pouch. Now, this is an operation that was uh, done in the early days in the US. It has no place. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, in modern medicine, there's a very high incidence of sepsis. And in the end, all of them will require a completion colectomy. Now, to do an iliorectal anastomosis in a patient who is very sick with toxic myocolon or you know, with impending perforation, perforation is really not sensible. Or patients with high dose of steroids or patients who are severely malnourished because you're asking for perforation to occur or, you know, or, or, or um, uh, leaking of the anastomosis, and that will make the patients even sicker. Yeah, so uh, when we talk about um, what is the right procedure for such acute patients, we, we consider whether we should do a total colectomy, uh, an ileostomy, or, or proctocolectomy and ileostomy. Now, we know that in these sick patients, mortality is very high. Um, the proctocolectomy has a higher risk in these patients because the dissection and the time needed and perhaps the difficulty uh, to do these patients' uh, rectum versus just doing a total colectomy. 
uh, which has a high, which has a lower uh, mortality rate. So most of us in a very very sick patient, um, unless the patient is not as sick, we would really choose to just do a total colectomy and a heliostomy. If there's bleeding from the rectum, we can always pack the rectum uh, with a large piece of uh, gauze or gauze wrapped in, in plastic for easier removal. And that works very well actually for emergency bleeding um, if we just want to do a total colectomy. Now, this really, is, as I said earlier, is the safest option. Uh, total, collect uh, total colectomy, leaving the rect rectum and then ileostomy. Now, this is sometimes called the St. Mark's operation. It's popularized in, in St. Mark's Hospital. Uh, the rectal stump uh, that is left behind can be oversown, or, or in this case, as in the picture here, brought out as a mucus fistula. Uh, with this sort of operation, when a patient is well, uh, other operations can then be uh, uh, considered. Uh, for example, you can do a subsequent erectile anastomosis if the rectum is not uh, severely involved or the patient does not want to run the risk of a pelvic operation or is worried about nerve injury, or we can go, out, go ahead to do a respiratory proctocolectomy. So and let's talk a little bit then here about the elective situation. Um, now, what sort of elective surgery? As we said earlier, um, in patients with uh, chronic ulcerative colitis, especially pen, uh, pen colonic uh, ulcerative colitis, um, you know, there's a chance of cancer. And we know that this, uh, this, the, the, the risk of cancer occurring in a patient with pen proctor uh, ulcerative colitis is about, uh, you know, uh, five percent at, at five to ten percent at twenty years, and every year after that increases about one percent. Uh, so, constant um, surveillance is important, and the development of dysplasia uh, in during our follow up of ulcerative colitis is an indication for surgery. And cancer is highest in acute onset colitis patients with pen colitis with colonic dysplasia, long standing colitis, and young age at onset. Uh, so this is something that we have to uh, consider carefully. And patients who had a ileorectal anastomosis or patients who've had uh, restorative proctocolectomy with without mucosectomy or or just with uh, you know an, a staple restorative proctocolectomy run also a risk of re of cancer in the retained uh, rectal mucosa. So uh, in elective cases, if we choose to do a total colectomy with an ileal rectal anastomosis, this operation is not uh, you are not removing the risk completely because the retained rectum can still give rise to cancer. Uh, and in order to do a, rest, uh, a total colectomy with ileal rectal anastomosis, the patient must have minimal rectal disease or is willing to continue medical treatment uh, of various sorts uh, to, the, to the remnant rectum. So, if we do, if we uh, in, in, intend to take out the rectum, then what options do we have? We can actually do what we call a pen proctocolectomy. This is the operation where we retain uh, the anal canal by remove the rectum as well as the colon. Now, this operation is not uh, widely used nowadays uh, uh, because um, although it sounds good, you don't have to have an anal wound. Uh, but uh, in the old days, 20, 30 years ago, when we did some of these operations, we found that the anal um, uh, remnant often breaks down and then it leads to a cavity within the pelvis, which is sometimes hard to manage. Uh, but in both uh, either anal pouch anastomosis or the band proct band, uh, proctocolectomy, uh, all the disease is removed. There's much less cancer risk. Um, um, and as I said, if we just do the uh, pen proctocolectomy, there is a uh, there is sometimes problem with the unhealed perineal wound or what we call uh, a pelvic uh, abscess cavity. Now, if we do the restorative proctocolectomy, what sort of options do we have? Uh, you see here on the right of the pictures, uh, we have on the left hand side um, what we call an S pouch. You can see the shape of the S here. Uh, and then the, in, uh, on the right hand side, we see what we call a W pouch. The W pouch basically is a, a two folds of an S pouch. Uh, 
So at that time, we believe that larger volume gives you a better function. Uh, and this, these two pouches, the S and the pouch were popular uh, in, in the UK and they were, they were pushed widely by uh, surgeons and St. Mark's. Now, the one in the center, the J pouch, uh, was popularized here in Asia. In fact, in Japan, I'll go through that in a while. Uh, so this uh, design using about 40 to 45 cm of, uh, of, of ileum. The other question uh, is whether to do a mu uh, uh, inner mucosectomy or not, uh, uh, or no mucosectomy. So the J pouch, uh, uh, sorry, the S pouch or W pouch were popularized uh, by, by John Nichols. Uh, and, and Alan Parks, and I had the privilege of working with, with them actually in 1989 uh, in St. Mark's. And here you see uh, operate, uh, operating with, uh, with John uh, on the earlier pouch actually in those days. Um, and because of the popularity of uh, the, 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 the St. Mark's surgeon and also because of the good results they had, we had many visitors and the operation was widely used at that time. But in Utunomiya in Japan, popularized the J-pouch. Now, the J-pouch has now become the most popular pouch. Uh, the reason is because it's simpler uh, to use. And whereas the S and the W-pouch had to be hand-sewn, uh, the J-pouch could be uh, easily fixed with, a, uh, with one fire of um, stapler. Normally, we use uh, two, either 200 mm linear stapler which will give you a 200 or 20 cm pouch or 275 mm uh, stapler linear stapler which will give you 150 uh, mm uh, long pouch and the bottom of the j will be, will be uh, su uh, sutured uh, to the uh, inner canal um, and that uh, can be either a staple or hand sutured and osmosis so basically, the technique of restorative proctocolectomy with the J-pouch is like this. We can use either open or laparoscopy. I think most of us nowadays would use minimally invasive uh, technique that is to use a laparoscopy. Or there are people also using robotic, of course. Um, uh, most of us use laparoscopy because it's we are covering the whole abdomen. It's much easier to use laparoscopy uh, rather than a, a fixed robot. Uh, the length of J-pouch can be just uh, fixed with... Uh, to 75 mm linear stapler, uh, which will give you 150 uh, mm long uh, J pouch. Now, because we are using uh, staplers, then most of us do not do anal mucosectomy. Uh, for myself, in my practice, uh, I always use a defunctioning ileostomy in these patients just so that uh, we can avoid uh, unforeseen leakages and uh, un unforeseen uh, problems, and we can sleep better after we do the operation. Uh, my practice has always uh, been to close this aleostomy at about two to three weeks. Uh, there is a technique we use to make uh, the closure easier by, by putting um, a seprofem uh, below the level of the muscle within the inner canal, so that it's, uh, sorry, within the abdominal cavity around the, le the end of the uh, ileum, so that it allows for easier mobilization. Now, with regards whether we should do a mucosectomy or no mucosectomy, as I said, because a lot of us are using staplers, uh, so, so we, we do not do mucosectomy because it's much easier to do. But we have to consider why we do and why we don't do, besides the ease of using stapler to form the ileal inner pouch uh, anastomosis. Now, if we retain the anal uh, mucosa above the dentate line, this actually uh, uh, retains the transitional zone. And we know from inner physiological studies that the, the inner transitional zone gives us inner sensation. So if you remove that mucosa, actually it results in poorer inner function, a poorer sensate uh, or, or sensation of whether it is gas, fluid, or solid. So excision of the uh, inner transitional zone gives rise to worse inner function. But if we leave uh, that mucosa, uh, we ourselves in our patients have seen a couple of patients with uh, cancer arising in the retained uh, anal mucosa. Um, 
So that's something that we need to monitor if we do not do the mucosectomy. And also that retained mucosa in some patients can get inflamed and result uh, in, in sort of um, retained mucosa um, colitis. So one has to be aware of all these uh, issues if one does or one does not do uh, mucosectomy. So just, uh, just to show you, so this is uh, on the left, you can see a patient with inflamed uh, colitis and on right, you see the ileal inner pouch that's been formed with the staplers in place. Yeah, so with uh, construction of the, of the pouch, uh, we get much better function. Uh, we, it, with the J pouch, we get function that can approximate uh, that of normal. I have many patients uh, who have severe frequency um, but after surgery, they approach normal. Uh, although they don't have colon with a, a properly constructed J-pouch uh, with uh, a, a double staple um, pouch in an osmosis, uh, a lot of patients, they go to the toilet one to three times a day and the stools are soft, uh, not, not necessarily uh, watery. Some of them have sort of form stool or very soft form stool. Now, the problems with pouches we see are patients who can develop uh, colli colitis or what we call pouchitis in the in the pouch. Some of them may need to be excised. Uh, we can treat them nowadays with various uh, medication, including uh, the usual medication we use for 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 for, for osteocolitis or with antibiotics. Some of them may need pouch excision if the symptoms are very severe. And because of the operation that we do uh, uh, in the rectum, uh, urinary dysfunction and impotence can result. Although when we do uh, surgery of the rectum for non-cancer cases we do close rectal dissection that means we don't operate the rectum in the plane outside uh, the rectal uh, the mesorectum unlike in patients with rectal cancer so that should mitigate or de decrease the risk of uh, pelvic uh, nerve dysfunction uh, but some patients even in females they can develop uh, dyspareunia uh, with uh, the pelvic operation as well. So when we look at um, ileal pouch inner anastomosis, we're not just talking about curing disease, but we want to give patients good outcome. And therefore, that's, this is where, uh, how we form the pouch, what operation we do when we remove the rectum, whether we do close rectal dissection, whether we do uh, a wider resection if there's a rectal cancer, together with the osteocolitis is important. And also whether we decide to do mucosectomy or no mucosectomy. But when we do the appropriate surgery, it offers a cure for these patients with osteocolitis with minimal morbidity and no mortality if we're doing it correctly. Uh, and we must always look at our patient's quality of life as well as functional outcomes uh, because this will be improved. And uh, we we find in our patients the improvement in quality of life is not just dependent on the number of bowel movements per day, but uh, with patients eating better, patients living better, uh, their whole outlook in life is improved when a very uh, you know, dysfunctional uh, colon and rectum uh, are, are removed uh, so that patients can really continue to do what they like uh, when they like and, and have a good quality of life. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Francis. Actually, actually, your talk hasn't overlapped my uh, discussion, what I did yesterday. I only enumerated the definitions of the surgeries. And uh, I always felt uh, in this session, it was a need to uh, really cover the surgical aspects more extensively in all the aspects of oxidative colitis. And you're very vividly uh, uh, address them and it was very clear uh, and we could understand uh, we're pretty clear from your talk the uh, strategies for surgical strategies for man managing oxygen colitis. I don't really find any questions in the chart and I myself also doesn't, do not have any questions for you. Mm. I think this is most may I? Sir. May I? May I? So I think uh, even if there was uh, a little bit of repetition of the terms, it is very important for the students and uh, students just to recapitulate 
because there is confusion in many textbooks also between the two terms one is what dr uh, francis used pan proctocolectomy which is also called total proctocolectomy so ppc or tpc which means removal of the entire rectum sacrifice of the sphincter no normal passage and a permanent terminal ileostomy yes on the other hand is restorative proctocolectomy rpc which means an ileal pouch anal anastomosis which is the ideal procedure many textbooks still call uh, 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 rpc also as total proctocolectomy which is not correct so that is one two things i would like to ask dr francis which we discussed yesterday also because uh, this uh, session is mainly for students and students are often asked these questions in the exams one is that when you are doing a total colectomy uh, with uh, leaving the rectal stump and a temporary ileostomy uh, what do you prefer to do in your practice what do you prefer to do with the rectal stump do you close it do you close but keep it under the parietes or do you bring out as a formal opening a mucus fistula yes i i that's that's a very good question uh, as i said in the st marks hospital in london they since the uh, ellen parks described the procedure and all they have always been bringing the mucus the rectum out as a mucus fistula at the bottom of the wound uh and uh, the then they bring out the ileostomy as a stoma in the right iliac fossa now um this often leads to a little bit of um wound infection at the low end of the wound and also you really have to leave a much longer segment of rectum which then of course gives you a bit more uh, problems with uh, continued proctitis Uh, in the remnant, uh, 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 what do you call, um, um, rectum. Now, if you want to leave uh, less rectum, uh, then you have to oversew it or staple it off, and then you can uh, just leave a, 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 a short segment. Now, my own um, um, practice, my own practice has been to actually try and dissect, depending on the patient's condition at the time of surgery. if the, his condition allows he, he's not uh, severely uh, unstable uh, and uh, anesthetists are quite happy i will try and dissect as much of the rectum as possible but not go into a very deep pelvis if the patient has a narrow pelvis and so forth uh, but just go as low as possible as as long as the patient is stable staple it off uh, and then bring out uh, the the stoma proximally uh, i think because in any case Uh, sometime in the future this patient will want to have an ileal pouch in you know, a nasmosis um and in which case if we if we are able to go as as low as possible then it makes our job easier also uh and also anything in the anything if, if the rectum is short and if there's any issues like bleeding and so forth we can always tackle it from the inner canal rather than having to you know Uh, do some more extensive uh, way of dealing with it so my 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 own approach to this would be to try and um, cut as much rectum as possible over sew it uh, and then uh, you know uh, do this proximal stoma but is when you that, say you would like is, when is you say you would like to well? go yeah when you say you would like to go as low as possible in the rectum i'm sure uh, you you would not do any retro rectal dissection because that would make the second surgery little difficult yes no. you, 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 you always want to see when i uh, when i do this operation in a patient with ulcer colitis uh, i'm especially in males of course females also have uh, sexual um, um, sort of sort of uh, nerves and feeling um, but males especially with the risk of impotence uh, we always do what we call a close rectal dissection Now in the old days it was not easy because in the old days we have to diatomize and cut diatomize and cut but now this with energy devices is much easier because we're just cutting close to the uh, rectal serosa and then going around and leaving a large chunk of the mesorectum behind um uh, which will then uh, mitigate against likely injury however if we are operating on chronic cases 
where there is uh, operating because of cancer and the rectum, then it's a different story. Then we have to go outside uh, the mesorectal plane. Uh, then that's a different story. But that would not be an emergency operation. Yeah, actually, that was the second question which I was going to ask. So if we go close to the rectal wall and leave the mesorectal fat uh, in the pelvis, in a narrow male pelvis, sometimes do you face difficulty in bringing the pouch through that narrow canal? Yeah, um, the the thing is this, if you res if you dissect in the close, what we call the close rectal dissection, uh, you find that the plane is not disturbed. And uh, when, you, when we actually operate a second time, we can lift up that fat and we can actually do the normal uh, sharp dissection in that plane so that the pouch can then go in again. So that, that, that is not a big issue. Uh, we, we haven't found that to be a big issue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thus, please carry on. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Thank yes. you very much, Dr. Francis. Actually, I for uh, in a lighter vein, I, I want to say you that your photographs were exceptional. Uh, in fact, I was focusing on them. I would like to know what happened to that person uh, after whom the crocodile was moving in the swimming pool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, we have to be careful of all these problems that we might face, you know. Okay, uh, thank you very much.